morning uh, flight from Dallas to New York. So in case you guys don't know, we're here at LaGuardia Airport. We're heading into New York. We're actually heading into Sotheby's. So I've bought some watches that they're gonna potentially auction. We're gonna go over some stuff. They have some cool watches to show us. So it'll be a cool collab today. So, you know, hopefully you guys enjoy this because this is a quick one day turnaround trip. Where the hell are we going? <laughs> Everybody, welcome back to the channel. Welcome to another episode of Grand Caliber. Today, we are in New York City at Sotheby's. I'm gonna introduce you to a good friend of mine here. Uh, I, brought up, I brought him some very special Daytonas to see if we could potentially auction them here, or maybe they have some clients too. We've been kind of working with them on this idea. So I'm gonna introduce you to my buddy, Skip. So come on inside, we'll, we'll take a look. I want to introduce you guys to my buddy Skip Powell at Sotheby's. He's going to be inspecting some watches for us today. And I brought three vintage Daytonas to potentially auction at Sotheby's. Um, if not, they might even find some private buyers here. So we're going to give it a shot. So this is the three watches we discussed. You guys, hey, yeah, uh, let's have a look. Do you guys um, have quite a bit of vintage Daytonas right now? We have historically. Um, right now, these would be the only three if we can if we can you know make a deal on them. Um, as you know, we did set the world record for a, a JPS. Uh, was that the Geneva, one that sold? Geneva sale? Yeah. Two point five million. Yeah, two point five. That's insane. Mm -hmm. That's insane. Like that just must have, that must have just simply been the results of a just complete bid war. Well, this is public information, so I can tell you I believe that Rolex bought that watch. <laughs> Somebody was beating, mm -hmm. like bidding against Rolex. Yeah, you're cool. never gonna win. I guess you could just make them pay for it. Yeah. <laughs> Buy 2.5 <laughs> million. Mm -hmm. The problem with those auctions is, like when they happen, then the people who are sitting on those exact watches are thinking their watches all of a sudden worth retail 2.5 million. Because mm -hmm. I ran into the, you know, recently a seller of the, one of these watches and they wanted north of two million. I was like, that's never gonna happen. Well, they should give it to us then, <laughs> if, if they want that kind if of money. Rolex is buying another one. Yeah, this is looking great. That's a, yeah, it's a beautiful piece. Mm -hmm. It's got papers too. I uh, sold this watch last year to a buddy of mine, but unfortunately, you know, sometimes people shuffle their yep, collections around change. and circumstances yeah. change. So he wants to, he, he doesn't want to sell it, but we, you know, it is what it is. How's the loom looking to you? Looks good. Yeah, it's reacting as it should. Yeah, it drops off nice and fast. Yep. So That's what great. he's basically looking mm -hmm. for is a reaction on the lumen. So this is a 1970, right? Mm -hmm. It's a 1970-6263. And during the 70s, they used, was it, um, was it radia? It wasn't radia. Zinc sulfide. Zinc, yeah, that's it. So you, they used zinc sulfide on the dial to glow because it would not need sunlight during those times. So if you bought this watch brand new and you looked at it at night, it would still be glowing. It wasn't, it wasn't dependent on the sun. So what happens over time, it has a shelf life of like, what, probably 10, 15 years? Yeah, yeah, the, so the half-life on tritium being um, 25 years and Promethium 147 being like two and a half years. Right. Uh, zinc sulfide somewhere in the middle, I believe. Right. And uh, yeah, today it will still react to UV, UV light, um, right. much like radium would or uh, Promethium. And it'll react greenish. Yeah, greenish. Right. And um, whereas like tritium reacts tritium, more white. Yeah, like this tritium dial is basically dead. Well, ignore the yeah. surface. Yeah. 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 yeah, let's show them. It's embarrassing. <laughs> <laughs> so like yeah, so you can see, vintage guys are so embarrassed yeah, by service you can, hands. You can tell that yeah, it does but, react to UV, but it doesn't glow at all. The yeah, way it gives you kind of like a, yeah, that'll actually glow. I have a bracelet with it. I have, mm -hmm. So I think this watch. Yeah, did you bring the papers with you? Uh, I did, yeah. So the theory I think behind this watch is that it was born with a strap because of the condition yeah. of the. the between the lugs. Between yeah. the lugs, which it has the strap. So it came with does this strap. Does it have the Rolex pen buckle on it too? I think so, yeah. Yeah. That's what came with the watch. Uh, and then this Some is 50 all. year old leather. Yeah. So, and it has handwritten papers. The watch was sold in Venezuela. Oh, very cool. Wait, I think. Yes, it sold in Venezuela in 1975, but 71 papers, I think. I guess they wrote 75 on it. Yeah, that's, but that's typical, right? For yeah, a lot, of metal. a lot of precious metal um, sport models ended up in South America. Yeah, that and they didn't sell very quickly. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Yeah, 2.3 million. Yeah. 
Oh, very cool. Right in line with the legend. Mm -hmm. <laughs> if you guys don't know what the legend is, mm -hmm. it's a solid gold 6260 with a three line R, is it RC, no, ROC, mm -hmm. right, ROC dial. Uh, and that would be a Paul Newman. And I think, God, like four, five, six years ago, they were fetching three and a half million dollars. Yeah. And there's what, Snip three? Test real quick. Yeah. Yeah, it smells old. <laughs> <laughs> That's a true nerd right there. Yeah. Because I do the same thing with the boxes mm -hmm. and stuff like that. If it doesn't smell old, it's suspicious. Yeah, early bracelet. Four years in bracelet. 68, I believe. Yeah. But I think mm -hmm. the watch was born on a strap. Yeah. And then we somebody added a bracelet later, which is common. I mean, we mm -hmm. see this all the time. Even in stainless steel variants, I see them adding the heavier 78, 78 350s. Yeah. Finding one of these bracelets is a feat in itself. Yeah. So I'm not mad about it being a couple years early. <laughs> Yeah, and it's a little off mm. too. Like the mm. color's more rosy than the watch. Yeah, one thing we I mean, they, well, it just would have. It's just oxidated. Well, made at a different time. The metallurgy yeah. might have been slightly different, and it could have oxidized, you know, in a drawer somewhere. Whereas this might have been on someone's wrist. True. Another thing cool, though, mm. you know, what we're mentioning um, is the pushers. So they're the prototype pushers, correct? Yeah, lineless. Yeah. Those are probably the coolest pushers you could find on any Daytona. The only thing we notice is like when I when I got the watch, the mm -hmm. bezel was near perfect, but I think he's worn it and yeah. then start, it's starting it's to- It's bubbling a little bit. It could be that Texas bit. heat. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I said, just stop wearing it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> just, maybe you know, but how many of these examples are out there because I, I hear for like the you know for the three line solid gold dials i've read there's 10 i've read there's 50 like they don't seem to have a, an exact idea but i couldn't tell you exactly but i can tell you how many i've seen mm -hmm. publicly which is like four four yeah so it's probably safe mm -hmm. to say it's far more rare than a yeah. newman mm -hmm. just not as desirable yeah, newmans were made at scale it's not yeah. a rare watch right you know um for me, what makes Rolex rare generally would be condition. Yeah. And, um, you know, when you're talking about single digit production numbers for a Rolex, that is almost unheard of. Right. This is the 662. 60, yeah, that's a really nice example. Mm -hmm. I think the bracelet is incorrect. I don't really like the way the end links are sitting on it. Yeah, these are 57s. Yeah, it's from a date. Mm -hmm. But I commonly see that issue. Mm -hmm. It's such a common issue. This is a watch I wish I auctioned. Mm -hmm. I had a 6240 Paul mm -hmm. Newman. Wow. And y'all, I think Sotheby's had sold one, and this one was five serial digits away. Oh, that's pretty one. cool. Yeah, it was like, they all have the same like 169, mm -hmm. it's like 1.692 something, they all into like, they have the first four, four digits, right? Mm -hmm. For the 6240s, for it to be com considered like acceptable. Yeah. And then the last two digits are what like kind of, set them apart like right down the assembly line have you shown this watch publicly no i never try to show big pieces like this publicly because i feel like it hurts the market yeah if you start like black like i'll tell you one thing i'll never do is like i would never take a 400 500 thousand dollar vintage daytona and post it on my website with a price like that yeah just be silly yep. you know these type of watches require very specific type of movement when you're moving them in the market what's what's probably the best watch y'all have had through here in your opinion. Ooh. Honestly, like my personal favorite was the Tornek Rayville that we sold um, in June. So um, it was basically a military only a watch for the US. Okay. You know, so it was in the hands of, you know, mostly like the precursor to the Navy SEALs. So like Navy frogmen, um, a few uh, Marines wore them. I don't think a lot of like uh, SOG guys had them, but there's always that chance. Um, I actually found this one from the original owner who was uh, in the Navy in the 80s, 90s, and early aughts. And he was issued this watch in 1987. Wow. And the last year in manufacture, so they basically only made them in two years, 64 and 66. Mm -hmm. And this was a 1964 watch and it wasn't issued until 1987. Damn. Which so is super strange. So where did it sit? Just in the quartermaster's office. Wow. Yeah. Are they automatic? Like, are they made? Yeah, they're automatic. They, so they used a lot of uh, beryllium in the movements because they had to be um, amagnetic as well as anti-magnetic right. because they're usually used for mine clearance and a lot of those had magnetic fuses. So what was happening is like the Navy would have basically sacrificial ships in front right. of like their aircraft carriers and destroyers and high value ships. Um, 
so they would you know physically run into the mines and cause them to go off thereby like you know saving the higher value ships towards the rear and what uh, the enemy did to circumvent that was have magnetic triggers so it would sense one ship goes by and then another ship goes by and then you know the third fourth fifth ship goes by and then it finally blows up right so you don't really want to have anything magnetic on your person when you're diffusing something like that True. because you can set it off just by having like a dive knife or something Damn, like that that's insane yeah so that's what you know one of the reasons uh, one of the uh, contract requirements for that watch this is a case bag opener people freak out when i pull these out open case bags like what <laughs> This one, I think we're gonna try to PS it, and then if it, if I can't close the deal with the person I have in mind, then we can put it into. Um, What's your number? I was gonna try to sell it for like two ninety. Two ninety. I know. Can we go a little north of that? No. No. No way. That's like what I would sell it for. Okay. Yeah. Um, okay, I'll talk to the seller. Mm -hmm. I'm sure he'll be all right with it because. Mm -hmm around the ballpark we discussed so well cool um do you want to do some, some paperwork on these or uh, are you, are yeah. you, do you want do you want to have some time to think about it no no, no. i'm going to call my client on this one talk mm -hmm. to my client on this one that one's mine i don't care we can uh, fire that one off you can sure. try to sell it private yeah i could literally do 21 day terms like of those three weeks okay um and after 21 days you can have it back sure yeah that's fine okay. all right guys we are we're done at sotheby's uh that was a great experience to open that door with uh skip over here at sotheby's so i'm excited to see where this uh relationship goes we hope that they sell these watches at desirable prices and then maybe we can give them more uh, so there you go. So this music is a representation of my day. Very classy. Very classy subway experience. I haven't taken the subway, so we're doing this for the experience. Finally got a deal done here on 47th Street. Yeah. Yeah. Without feeling like the best a, store. The first it store. is. I always like these guys. These guys are yeah. badass. If you're on 47th Street, there's the first store right in the on the corner of 47th and what is this? Six. Six. So it's like right at the beginning of the uh, right at, right at the beginning of the jewelry district. So you got to stop by and see these guys. They have solid prices. Super good prices. So I'm happy. Yeah, yeah. We'll give you guys a shout out. So you guys are uh, get this on there. Cool. Uh, just invoice my company and then I will wire you tomorrow. Right, guys i hope you guys genuinely enjoyed this it was a lot of fun to shoot uh it was just a quick day trip to new york to go to sotheby's real quick and 47th street just for fun if you guys enjoyed it don't forget to like subscribe and hit the bell